Hi, welcome to Learning Leader Spotlight, the podcast where we interview the learning leaders of today to help the learning leaders of tomorrow. I am Leanne Langford, your host. I'm the president of Training Pros. Training Pros is a learning and development contract staffing company. We like to say at Training Pros, when you have more projects than people, let us help you find the best consultant to start your project with confidence. I am really excited today about our guest. Today, we have Dr. Jamie Kraus. She's the Director of Learning and Development at Indeed, and everybody knows who Indeed is. Everybody at some point has used Indeed. So, hi, welcome, Jamie. Thank you so much. It's great to be here. It is great to have you. Can you share with our audience a 60-second overview of who you are and what you do? Sure. So as you mentioned, I work at Indeed and sit within a global learning and development function aligned to our revenue teams. And in that organization, I lead something called the Global Programs Org. We are responsible for setting the standards of knowledge across three key areas, global onboarding for sales and client success, functional leadership and coaching, and global systems, tools, and processes. So I like to say we get to enable our newest employees amplify the impact of those who lead them, and then optimize everyone's work by identifying how to best leverage the resources at their disposal. Um, and on the team, I would say we are really laser focused on providing value through business alignment and working hard to really validate the investment the business has made in learning with us. You'll probably hear throughout that interview time and time again, this echoed, it is truly critical, um, this focus. And it, partly because it really matters to us that the time spent away from the desk and away from helping people to get jobs is Indeed's mission, has ROI. And I say ROI colloquially, um, but also with this, the rigorous intent that's meant behind it. We talk a lot about what's in, in it for me to satisfy adult learners. And so when an L&D organization is aligned to revenue generating teams, that with them is often revenue and retention. And so um, on our team, we are working really hard to show and not tell the value added from our enablement solutions inclusive of that return on investment. So that is a little, little bit about what I do at Indeed. Truly love my job and uh, love all the people who I get to work with every day. You know, when you love what you do, it's, you never work a day. Exactly. That's amazing. Um, well, on that note, how did you first get moved into LD, how did you first get attracted to it? What brought you here? I love this question. Um, so people typically find their way to LD one of two ways. I like to say they either grow up in the business, um, they attended a training themselves and thought like, ooh, that looks really interesting or benefited from a mentor relationship and thought like, I'd love to be on the other side of this and, and help people learn and grow. Um, so they're drawn to LD that way or they take a more academic path which could include coming from an adjacent field like education, I took a very academic route. So I'm an educational psychologist by trade and spent many years in graduate school studying how people learn, including identifying all of the barriers that really get in the way of learning. I also studied how to evaluate programs to prove impact. And so to take a few steps back out of college, I wanted to become a counselor. And so that's what I did first out. I pursued my master's degree and I started working with college students. And in that work, I was noticing a lot of adult learners really struggling with self-doubt, low motivation, fear of failure, and general anxiety towards learning. And I wanted to understand how those seeds get planted. As humans, we have to learn every single day to survive, and we've proven that we're very capable of learning and applying that new information. So we are born to learn, and yet... Why does formal learning come so easily for some of us and others really struggle? They say sometimes that you pursue, you pursue the thing that um, you struggle with. And that's, that's been the case for me. I had a really hard time at school um, growing up and wrestled with being the daughter of high achieving parents and a high achieving family. Um, and so much so that I'd kind of written off academics, honestly, to focus on athletics. I was a college athlete. And I don't know that I was taking college as seriously as I should. I was much more focused on soccer, but I had a professor of psychology. Thank you, Dr. Michael Ryder, who was relentless um, until I joined his research team. And thank goodness, because that 
change the trajectory of, of my career. And so kind of bringing it back, I love that I can apply educational sci work educational psychology theories and frameworks every day in my role. Um, when I think about incorporating self-efficacy, social cognitive theory, self-determination theory, along with adult learning theory, um, with that deep focus and measurement and evaluation, it provides a richness and a context to the ne enablement solutions that we deliver. And I think added impact. And so all the time, you know, thinking about my background, I'm constantly scanning environments, looking for what are those barriers towards learning, um, along with how to maximize those solutions or maximize our resources so solutions are sustainable, repeatable, and impactful. And um, just kind of bringing those theories together. Look, people have different values for um, for work. Not everyone wants to self actualize at work and be their best selves. And so, minimally. It is my hope that learning is effective. It, it, it enables our internal clients to do their jobs well. But for those of us who are really desiring something more, my hope is that learning at work helps us become the best version of ourselves. And so um, I'm grateful to have a background in educational psychology to be a true learning nerd and think about that every single day. It's a great story. It really is. Um, I was never a great student either, but I, I did take college very seriously. I worked extra hard. Um, so, yeah, not, not so much high school. So can you tell us about the biggest changes you've seen in the last three to five years? Sure. So we share it over and over again. There's a ton of a focus on L&D becoming a business partner instead of an order taker. So we've, we've kind of heard that line repeatedly. And initially, there was dialogue about getting the seat at the table or being in the room where it happens if you're a Hamilton fan. Um, but witnessing business strategy is not the same as participating in the conversation as a strategic advisor. And so with increased exposure and trust as L&D is, is gaining every single year, we can be incredibly impactful in advising the business when making decisions about things that span beyond in taking a training request, um, things like structure and metrics and goals, um, and then especially leveraging that information when advocating for enablement solutions that ought to be driven by that business strategy. Um, each time I attend a conference like ETD, I'm, I'm seeing this evidence of our collective evolution. Um, and I'll also say there's so much more measurement rigor than we've ever seen before in our work. We are being much more thoughtful and discerning training requests so we can tie those solutions to business challenges, associated business goals, and observable behaviors with metrics um, held accountable by accessible data sources. So I think we're asking different kinds of questions in our relationships with the business. Um, and these questions are helping us prove our impact on the requests that we take on and equally redirect requests that may not solve the problem that led to the request. And so uh, the last thing l and wants is training to amount to wasted time or low value add. And we don't want this any more than the business does. And so um, historically, l and has been pretty rigorous about learning theory as we're delivering solutions. But I'd love to see that we are pairing that information with business acumen and data fluency with our work, which is a really, really powerful combination. That's great to hear. I, I've been hearing that frequently that we're um, L and D. We're, we've moved so far in the the eyes of the business now. When I was first in L and D in the nineties, nineteen nineties, it was very hard. We did not have anything close to a seat at the table. <laughs> um, and yes, it, we had to justify our existence probably quarterly. It seems like so, sir. And it's, it seems like it has really shifted over the last few decades. And I'm so happy to see that. Me too. Where do you think we're headed in the next five to 10 years? Well, we're talking about seats at the table. So, you know, as we continue to be strategic advisors, really leveraging that business acumen and data fluency, um, we are making space for AI to have a seat at the table. And so... Um, no surprise there. We need to think about AI and leverage it for its capabilities, but equally understand its limitations. And I don't think we are 
quite there yet um, in, in defining AI's limitations. So there's a, an expression in research, garbage in and garbage out. And so AI is only as good as what we're inputting into, um, into the system. Um, and so I think about, you know, the future being contingent upon us being able to harness um, the power of AI to solve right, uh, the right problems. I have a colleague I work with, I call him a niece of the future. And he is uh, setting a really fantastic example of that balance of business acumen, L&D rigor, and expertise. Um, and I, I just was talking to him yesterday about how he's weaving in AI to drive operational efficiency with some impressive results. And so in the next five years, L&D professionals are really going to need to sharpen their business partnership and consultation skills to inform decision making that so that we're leveraging business acumen and analytics and adult learning theory through AI and its capabilities. I, I love it. Um, that's a great insight. Um, let's switch to something a little more personal. Who has been your most influential professional mentor in your life? Oh my gosh. It's like picking your favorite child of, of whom I have two. So I can't, I, I don't know that I could pick one, but, um, honestly, I'm so grateful to have a number of truly exceptional professionals who have guided me in this career. Earlier in my career, uh, a man named Polly Rodney taught me about business partnership and user experience. That was when I was working um, in the nonprofit sector. And then when I transitioned to corporate America, Nishila O'Dowd really helped me apply what I learned in educational psychology to corporate learning. She, she helped me uh, build that bridge. These days, I'm turning to Christopher Neubauer to really deepen my understanding of aligning instructional design with business goals, which is the name of his book um, that I follow rigorously. Um, and I also really count on him for industry exposure. He's helped make some wonderful connections that have led to a lot of fruitful partnerships. Um, and lastly, I will say I'm so, so lucky that my manager for the past five years plus Christine Youngkin is just a master class in tying all the things that I mentioned together. She is brilliant and wise, strategic and kind, and yet somehow also humble. Um, she knows how to create environments that help people be their best selves. And I learn from her every day. Um, I love that you have so many mentors you've used. Um, I'm a big advocate of mentorship, um, finding a mentor for yourself and being a mentor for others. Yes. So today, what is the most, um, what's the skill you find the hardest to find when you're hiring an employee or hiring a contractor? Sure. Um, I've got, I've got two answers for this one too. One of them, um, is probably easier on the surface to be able to demonstrate than others. But I think if you're looking for it, you can find the second one. So the first one is just a desire to do the right thing, even when it's the much harder thing to do. And so I am all about efficiency and effectiveness, but I never want a Band-Aid solution if we know we're just going to return to this problem later on. So I'd much rather break something to build it the right way. And so I'm looking for people who are willing to roll up their sleeves and do the hard thing, even when it may not be the most popular decision, when we know that it's the right thing to do. Um, and then the other answer I'll share is if you're familiar with the six types of working genius framework, I would say discernment, it can be really tricky to come by. And um, discernment is really the ability to take in all of the relevant information about, let's say, a training request in our case, including things like org design, talent strategy, business prioritization, impact, environment, systems, tools, processes, accountability, change management, appetite for change leadership by an enablement resourcing, all of that stuff to use all of this information simultaneously and then determine whether or not we should do something. I think that can be really, really tricky. That said, the good news is discernment is just like anything else. We can all be discerning. Um, but again, it's, it's often the harder thing to do. It's much easier to say yes than to say why. Um, and so one of the best ways to build it, I think, is really paying deep attention to the environment where you work and, and holding yourselves accountable as an L&D professional, just to the same knowledge that your clients are expected to have. Um, that, one, and that will help you, I think, leverage discernment in future decision making. Uh, that's very insightful. 
Um, I recently read that book. And yes, discernment seems to be one of the skills that we don't lean into as a creative genius. Most of us, only a few of us do. I don't, but <laughs> it's very hard to, it's, it's not a natural um, part for me. So um, where do you get your industry news and information? Oh my gosh. I have a voracious appetite for learning. Um, and I love this question. Um, and I'll say I have a handful of uh, different resources for different purposes. So I think ATD puts on great conferences and I've gotten to hear industry heroes like Adam Grant, Daniel Pink, Stephen M. R. Covey. Um, I've learned so much by not just the keynotes, but then attending ses sessions and getting to network with people. So I love that for our live experiencers. Um, I really appreciate LinkedIn and the platform it creates for anyone to be able to share insights and wisdom. So you don't have to be on a big stage in front of thousands of people. I think sometimes those little gems that, um, you know, the everyday L&D professional is sharing, I, I love to incorporate those and, and help amplify um, their work and messages. And then um, in terms of publications, I really like training magazine and training industry. I think they're great to follow kind of ongoing trends. Um, and then I really like Brandon Hall for their treasure trove of reference materials, such as case studies and industry reports. Um, there's, I'll, I'll share a couple more. Uh, the Training Mags and uh, Emerging Leaders um, program and then Sales Enablement Pro um, puts out cohorts of like rising talent. And I love to watch those to see kind of who, who am I excited to be hearing from in the next few years? And I really like to follow and, and watch the people who win those. Um, and lastly, for our measurement and evaluation, the ROI Institute is a great resource. Jack and Patty Phillips are truly special people, and I've learned so much from them. So I probably could go on and on, but I, I love to learn, and I will uh, take any chance I can get to do so. That's quite a few resources. Um, it must be hard to keep up with that much. Thank goodness you love to learn. So, <laughs> yeah, no, I follow a lot of those myself, but it's very hard to keep up with so many different sources. So to that, I would say um, I, I've heard a lot of people kind of echo that. And look, I feel similarly. And I think I'm a unique person in that my passion is also my profession. And so um, I like to read those things for fun. And that's so that's one thing that works for me, but I would say making time and scheduling time every day in your calendar to learn might be just one tip and, and not letting as much as you can that, that time get booked over, or if it does get booked over, then finding another hour or whatever it is so that, you know, there's always a danger in becoming the cobbler's kids without shoes. And so, uh, you know, I think in making time to learn is, is so vital to stay um, effective in our field. It is it, making the time to learn. We just, like the, you know, like you said, the shoemaker's children have no shoes. You know, we have to take care. We have to learn ourselves every day. So we stay relevant as well. Uh, what is one book that you would recommend for anyone who is wanting to move into a learning leader role? I would say, and I, I mentioned it earlier, but Christopher Neubauer's book, Aligning Instructional Design with Business Goals is such a practical um, guide to help reorient an L&D leader from, um, I suppose, executing work that may not be as business aligned to being laser focused on business prioritization, business goals, business impact, measurement rigor. It's, it's, a, it's a really helpful model. It's an eight-step approach to aligning instructional design, the requests we get every day. Um, he's done a really interesting job of recasting the Addy model um, and, and creating almost like an accordion view of it and, and positioning measurement happening throughout the model versus just at the end. And so I would say any L&D leader um, would benefit greatly from, from uh, incorporating that approach in their strategy. Definitely one I need to um, make a, an effort to read. So um, I think depending on the model that you studied in school, a lot of a lot of the models do have measurement throughout the Addy, but a lot of them don't. So 
it's nice that there's a um, a book about aligning with business goals, however, because I think that's where we used to miss more. So thanks. I love that recommendation. And I always end up with a nice list of books for my Audible so I can run around and listen to a book as I walk and do housework or whatever. <laughs> well, you've been a wonderful guest. Thank you so much for joining us on Learning Leader Spotlight. You provided a lot of good information. I mean, honestly, if our listeners probably will have to listen to it twice to take, get their notes down enough because you have a lot of different topics that you were able to really talk about with us. Um, and since you've already heard several of our episodes, you're not going to be surprised that as a thank you, I want to plant five trees in your name. That's our charity at Training Pros. Um, this month we're planting um, urban reforestation trees. So we're planting trees in inside cities where they need to have trees planted. So we'll plant five in your name and I'll send you a certificate about that as our thank you for your time. Oh my gosh. Uh, that is, that's fantastic. I, I love that. And I love that you do that. Thank you so much for, for giving back in that way. And thank you for having me. It's been great fun to chat with you. And if folks do have questions, um, please feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn. I love making new connections. Fantastic. Yeah. We'll include your LinkedIn, um, profile link in our notes for the, for the episode. And that's it for this episode of Learning Leader Spotlight. Um, I hope you enjoyed the episode and tune in next week to hear who we're going to speak with next time. <laughs>